Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm glad to get to your phone calls and emails. Uh, You know, I actually was in college for about a year and a half, and while I was at the college, they happened to film the the movie called Animal House uh, uh, there. And at one point, the late John Belushi, his character John Blutarski, said seven years of college down the drain. And, uh, you know, because obviously he was not the best student in the school, to, uh, to say it, put it mildly. I was reminded of that when I saw today that our fearless commander-in-chief, Joe Biden, said why we have reduced America's debt by $1.7 trillion in the last two years. Now, you would think after 50 years of so-called public service and elective office that Joe Biden has been doing well, enriching his family through the Biden crime family, that uh, he would understand the difference between debt and deficit. He has not reduced the deficit. He has certainly not done what he claimed to have done, reduced the debt by $1.7 trillion. But maybe after 50 years in elective office in the Senate and in the vice presidency and now in the presidency, that even Joe Biden would understand what debt and deficit are. But what he does understand is what you can do with an internal revenue service that is dramatically increased in size by about 87,000 IRS agents with $80 billion of the taxpayers' money. And now there's a brand new pick to head up that agency, and I wanted to find out more about him, so I've called Brandon Arnold, who is Executive Vice President at the National Taxpayers Union. Brandon, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me on the show again. Can you tell me about this uh, person who's going to head up the IRS with its gigantic army of now 87,000 uh, soon-to-be additional agents working uh, to go out and, I guess, shake down everybody they can for a few extra dollar? Yeah, so his name is Danny Werfel, and today he had a hearing before the Senate Finance Committee. Um, he's got a background in government in that he worked at the OMB under both George W. Bush and under Barack Obama. And then he's been out of government for about 10 years. He did have a brief stint at the IRS as acting commissioner right after Lois Lerner uh, did her little rampage in which she went after conservative groups and tried to silence their speech. He moved in to try to clean up the mess. But there's not a whole lot of paper on him. He's been in the private sector for about 10 years. He had this hearing today, and he didn't really answer a lot of questions. He was very polished in fending off questions, sometimes tough questions from Republican senators. But he didn't really tip his hand all that much about how he intends to lead this agency that, as you know, is going to be supersized under uh, the Biden administration. Well, I would think that I didn't get a chance to watch the hearing, but you did. Um, were they asking, what What are you going to do with these additional 87,000 agents? Because Joe Biden would have you believe we're going to hire all these people and they're going to go after all the rich people in America. They'll be they'll be crawling up, uh, you know, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates backside and Jeff Bezos and the rest of those billionaires. They're going after those people. But is do you expect there's any truth to the idea that the IRS is not going to use this massive new army to go after middle income and even lower income Americans? Yeah, I think they're going to go after everybody. Uh, they're in revenue maximizing re- mode, which means they are trying to squeeze as many dollars out of taxpayers as they can, whether those taxpayers make $40,000 and are scraping by, or whether those taxpayers make $4 million and are doing quite well. So the Republicans on the, at the hearing today, and, and I did watch it, they asked the right questions and, and they were tough with them at times, but he mostly just punted. He mostly said, I will look into these issues. I will work closely with Republicans and Democrats on the committee to investigate these problems. And we'll try to get to the bottom of what's been happening at the IRS. He didn't really show what he intends to do with this massive increase in funding. He didn't commit even to supporting legislation to statutorily require that the IRS not increase its rate of audits for people making $400,000 or less. Keep in mind that Yellen, the Secretary of the Finance, uh, Secretary of the Treasury commit, uh, uh, Department, she issued a statement saying that they wouldn't, but there's nothing binding to that. We don't even know how long Yellen will be the secretary. So we need some statutes that lock the IRS in to make sure that they're not harassing working class Americans. He did not commit to supporting one. Well, in fact, at the National Taxpayers Union, I think you track these numbers. I don't have time to track them. But as I understand it, over the last couple of years, the IRS has increased the number of audits. But proportionately, they're going after middle and lower income people a whole lot more than they are after the rich. Don't the numbers support that? Yes. And the the problem is you have a number of low income programs like the earned income tax credit, even the child tax credit, particularly under the expansion that we had under the pandemic. 
You have the American Opportunity Tax Credit that helps people pay for college or helps people pay for their children's college education. These have very high fraud and improper payment rates. So that is where the IRS has traditionally been looking. For, and on top of that, you know, lower income folks tend to be easy money in the eyes of the IRS because if they send them a, a nasty gram, a letter saying they owe an extra 500 bucks or $1,000 or what have you, people are more, more likely to pay for it because they don't want to fight the IRS. They don't have the time. They don't have the resources. They don't have the money to fight the IRS. Whereas if you send that same letter to the taxpayer making $4 million, well, guess what? The lawyer, lawyer up. They will bring their accountants into the equation. The IRS is going to have to go through a lengthy back and forth process, whether it's an audit or whether it's just a request for additional taxpayer resources. And it's a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more effort on the behalf of the IRS. So Brendan, that is one of the reasons why we've seen them skew in the direction of the lower income folks. Sorry to interrupt you, Brendan. I want to ask you something. Somebody told me last week, uh, and it was one of the guests we had on the show, said, look, the IRS likes to win and, and they hate to lose. And and they said this shows up in their policies because then they do pick those people who are least likely to be able to fight, least likely to object, most likely to just sit down and write a check and have it over with. Have you found that to be true? Yes, absolutely. You know, the IRS has a lousy record of squeezing more taxpayer dollars, more tax dollars out of large corporations for that very reason, because they have huge accounting departments, because they have tons and tons of attorneys who will fight these fights for them. So when they do take on these uh, larger entities, not only does it take a lot more time and effort on the behalf of the IRS, they're more like, like they're less likely to win. They're less likely to get any additional tax revenue, whereas those lower income folks, they can squeeze them. They know they don't have the resources. They know they don't have the ability to fight back the same way that more, uh, more well-off folks do. So that's why they've traditionally attacked and audited lower income Americans. Brandon, I've been critical of the earned income tax cut. I think it, it moves us in a direction of guaranteed national income or negative income tax. I think even Friedman called it back in the day. And I don't want to see the cheating there either. But it stuns me how you say these are high, you know, uh, these are areas where we find high levels of fraud by people against the government and in favor of them and against all the other taxpayers. Why is it so hard to make sure that, that when they pay out these benefits, that they're paying them out only to the people who are legitimately getting them under the law, because it doesn't seem like it would be that tough to say, okay, you claim the earned income tax credit. Let's see the social security numbers, dates of birth, other things that we routinely give up to the IRS when we file our taxes. Is it that hard to, to make a system that, uh, that, that doesn't get defrauded all day long? Well, let me give you two answers there. One, one is the charitable one, and that is the fact that the tax code is extremely complicated, and the earned income tax credit and other similar programs are extremely complicated. You have uh, disagreements over custodial uh, relationships with children who, who, if you have uh, parents that don't live with one another, uh, who claims that earned income tax credit? How is that divvied up? So the programs are very difficult, particularly if you're a working parent and you don't have an accountant that's going to help you out. You don't have the time and effort to look over your three kids, work a job, and do your taxes the way you'd like to. Right. Now, the other problem here, the less charitable take, is the fact that the IRS doesn't really have strong incentives to maintain properly functioning programs. They're, it's a lot easier just to maximize throughput, just to send out these checks with very minimal scrutiny, than it is to actually review the applications in a very detailed fashion. That's and that that's the one that makes the most sense to me. Brandon Arnold is the executive vice president of the National Taxpayers Union. Mr. Arnold, thanks very much. I appreciate your time. If you want to jump into the best conversation in talk journalism, it's 866 Hey Lars. That's 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com.